Hi everyone. Um, today we're going to be talking about avian spread of invasive species. Um, this is presented by the Capital Region Partnership for Regional Invasive Species Management as part of the New York State Invasive Species Awareness Week for 2021. My name is Lauren and I'm going to be your speaker today. Um, I'm the Education and Outreach Coordinator for the Capital Region PRISM. And we have a lot to cover today. So today we're going to learn about what the PRISM is, um, what invasive species are, and how they affect our environments, uh, the role of birds and the spread of invasive species, some common species that are spread by birds, and how you as a citizen scientist can get involved. So a little bit about the PRISM. The PRISM is a quasi-governmental nonprofit organization hosted by Cornell Cooperative Extension of Saratoga County. And it's funded by the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation through the EPF, so the Environmental Protection Fund. Uh, the Capital Region PRISM is one of eight PRISMs across the state. We cover 11 counties surrounding the Capital Region, including Albany, Columbia, Herkimer, Montgomery, Saratoga, Schenectady, Rensselaer, Warren, Washington, Green, and Fulton. Um, so those are the 11 counties that we cover and we do a lot of work to prevent, detect, and manage invasive species in our region. It's called a partnership because we work with other agencies, other nonprofit organizations, uh, volunteers, and a whole other slew of people. We all work together to um, make this mission come to life. So invasive species, what are they? Invasive species are any non-native organism that has the ability to cause harm to the environment, the economy, and or human health. They often share a lot of the same characteristics. So um, they have higher seed or egg production and can spread um, through fragmentation or rhizomes of their plant, which increases their reproduction. They're very well adapted to disturbed environments and altering conditions. They can outcompete native species for light, food, shelter, etc. And they alter natural cycles. So they can change nutrient cycles, food cycles, um, and other natural cycles that are occurring in nature. In the PRISM network, we use something called the invasion curve to determine um, where our resources are going to be put. So the invasion curve divides invasive species up um, into different tiers or into different uh, categories, depending on how long they've been in an area, how large the infestation area is, and how costly it would be to uh, get rid of them. So prevention is where we like to start. That is our ideal um, area to reduce costs and to prevent the effects of invasive species on an area. So this is why we have webinars like this and we have other in-person events um, throughout the year to increase awareness um, and stop the spread. So we'll, we'll prevent species from even entering into an area. If a species uh, gets by us and we, we don't know that it's there, we can still do something about it if it's in small numbers and it's at a localized population. So that's the eradication stage. Um, we often refer to these species as tier two. So they're within our boundaries, um, but they're at low population density and the control costs is still in our benefit. So if we um, spend a little money to control them, there's still gonna be that benefit that outweighs the costs. Um, unfortunately, if we don't catch it then, then it 
becomes a bigger area of infestation and the amount of time um, that it has been in an area increases in which we have to contain the population. So there's a rapid increase in the distribution and the abundance and eradication becomes very unlikely at this point. Um, so we just wanna contain it to keep it out of natural areas um, like state parks um, or um, rivers, lakes, things like that, that we really rely on for ecosystem services um, and for enjoyment. So this is the time that the public typically becomes aware. So um, having events like this, we're trying to decrease that time here. Um, so we'll bring it down to hopefully prevention and eradication so that um, we can keep those control costs down and uh, limit the impacts on the environment. If all else fails um, and we don't realize that a species is invasive until it's too late, then um, that's when we enter resource protection and the long-term management stage. Um, so there are a lot of species that are in this stage just because we had no idea that they were invasive before and they got really out of hand. And at this point, they're so widespread that um, eradication is impossible. And we are just trying to keep um, our natural resources protected and suppress populations from entering um, really pristine areas. So these are known as tier four species. So each of these blocks is a tier. So tier one is prevention, tier two eradication, tier three containment, and tier four is the long-term management. So we're trying to avoid adding more species to the tier four list um, because the control cost just becomes out of control. And um, it, it becomes very unlikely that we can do anything significant about um, that species or that population. There are lots of different vectors of spread. Um, international shipping is a really big one. Um, in the past 30 to 40 years, the amount of international trade has really skyrocketed and we have seen a correlation between the amount of species that are um, becoming invasive and um, international shipping. So there have been some laws and regulations in place to kind of combat that, um, but it's impossible for us to catch everything. So that is a way that invasive species have come into our borders, um, but also recreation. So if you're in an area and you brush up against something that has some seeds and you go to another area, um, you could be actually a vector of spread. Um, same thing goes for boating or fishing. Um, if you're using something and you don't clean it off before bringing it to a new area, then that can spread invasive species as well. Um, vehicles, so cars, uh, motorcycles, bicycles, boats, um, all of those things can unknowingly transport invasive species. So some things will lay eggs or um, a seed from a tree will drop on your car and you'll be driving and it'll just blow off in the wind um, or the eggs will hatch in a new area. Um, so that's another big vector. Wildlife. Um, so this is one that people don't often think about. People often um, associate invasive species with um, international trade and things like that. Um, but wildlife are a really big vector of spread. So today's topic is the avian spread. So bird spread of invasive species. Um, but other wildlife such as deer, um, rabbits, and other uh, grazing animals can transfer seeds and uh, other parts of plants and animals um, that are invasive. Finally, weather and climate. Um, so this is one that is becoming more and more relevant um, due to climate change. So species from the southern parts of the United States are actually moving north to adapt to the, the changes in climate. Um, so the rise in temperatures or um, drought conditions. So um, species from down south are actually becoming invasive up here because they're not um, 
they're more well adapted to these these new changes in the climate that our native species aren't. Um, so that's something to be aware of as well. So today our big topic is the role of birds in the spread of invasive species. Um, and we'll actually talk about uh, an invasive bird at the end. Um, you might be familiar with it, you might not. So we're gonna learn some things today. So this is basically um, the cycle of how birds spread invasive species, um, just a general overview of how it happens. So an invasive plant will drop its seeds or have uh, fruit on its branches. The bird will feed on those seeds or the fruit. The bird will land on a new branch um, and do nature's duties, <laughs> duty, get it? Um, and some of those seeds can actually survive in the gut of the bird and will be deposited and start a whole new plant. Um, and then this cycle continues. So we'll talk about a couple species that um, follow this pattern and talk about how you can be, get involved and um, kind of stop this cycle and get involved in other ways as well to stop the spread of invasive species. So avian spread is unintentional. So most introductions are unintentional by birds. So seeds and fragments, um, small insects can get stuck to the feathers of um, birds. And frequently they found that migratory waterfowl are one of the most common vectors um, for spreading invasive species, um, especially aquatic invasive species. Um, but there are species that are spread terrestrially, um, and we want to be aware of those as well. So we'll go into a little bit of identification of the species that are spread by birds. Oops. So first is the hemlock woolly adelgid. Um, this is a big one in our area. So last summer, they actually found hemlock woolly adelgid um, near Lake George which is a big problem because the Adirondack State Park is covered in hemlocks and the hemlocks are very important for erosion control and they support a lot of biodiversity. And um, they also have an aesthetic value that we don't wanna lose. Um, so the hemlock woolly adelgid is a sap sucking insect that feeds on the Eastern hemlock trees. Um, they're easily spotted in the winter um, when they have this white a woolly mass that grows over them. You can see here and in this photo up here. Um, they sit at the base of the hemlock needles and they will feed. And then um, that white woolly sack will become the egg sack for um, eggs to hatch out of in the spring. In the fall, um, this is what they look like. They're a little black dot basically at the the base of a hemlock needle. This was actually taken um, by a co-worker of mine up in the Adirondacks um, in October. So you can kind of see here how tiny they are and difficult to spot. Um, so we typically go out and look for them in the winter when they're um, more visible. But in the spring, um, before they settle down onto a needle, they are at the crawler stage. So this means that um, they're actively moving to try to find a needle that they that they like and that they want to feed off of. Um, but at this stage is when they actually attach to birds. Um, they, there's a lot of studies right now um, understanding which species exactly are moving them and um, if they're attached to the plumage or the feet um, of the birds. But there is a correlation between where um, this invasive species has been moved to and bird migratory patterns. So um, birds are a major vector in the spread of this species in particular. So the black throat green warbler is actually um, a very common species that is found in hemlock trees and uses hemlock trees um, to roost in and to um, find food. So this is a species that has been studied extensively in the spread of hemlock lily adelgid. And also the blue-headed vireo 
is a another species that uses hemlock trees and could be spreading um, the hemlock willy adelgid. Another species that is spread by birds is the water chestnut. Um, water chestnut is a floating aquatic plant and it grows in rosettes, so it grows in a, a big circle and each leaf is triangular with a serrated edge. In the late summer um, and early fall, they develop this um, funky looking seed. And so it has four spines and it turns black when it's ready to fall off. And this seed will fall down into the sediments and then um, in the spring, they will germinate and um, start a whole new rosette that will float up to the surface using these little bulbs here. This species is very difficult to control once it's in an area due to the viability of the seeds and how easily the seeds do fall off um, when they're, they're ready. Um, so this species can clog waterways, it can change water quality, and it can outcompete submerged and floating aquatic vegetation. Um, it can also make it hard for fish to survive underneath because they're, um, the plants that they normally would forage in or find shelter in um, can't grow because they're shaded out by this species here. This species is commonly spread by waterfowl. Um, it has been found in the plumage of Canadian geese. Um, so we are trying to understand that a little bit better um, and try to remove um, water chestnut before it goes into seed so that that doesn't happen because it is very difficult to control and if we have birds um, unknowingly spreading the seeds into new and pristine areas, um, then that can cause major problems and can um, be very costly to manage. All right, so Japanese barberry. This is one you may have heard of. This is commonly used in landscape settings. Um, it's a woody shrub and it has elongated leaves with spiny branches and can come in a range of colors. So um, pictured here is a like a nice green color, but it can also be in a deep rich purple or red color. The birds actually feed on these red berries that persist through the winter and um, we'll spread it that way because the, the, the berry is what they feed on and the seed will survive in their gut and they will poop it out. Um, and start holding populations. So we wanna avoid that um, because it is a poor nutrient source. So um, despite having those berries that last through the winter, um, the berries actually don't provide enough nutrients for the birds and can harm them when they're um, migrating um, because they won't have enough of that energy that they need. And they also, if, this is the only plant that's available to them. They'll continue to feed and feed and feed and feed, um, which will continue to spread the seeds, um, but they also will not be getting that nutrients that they need. Um, this plant also harbors ticks. It grows in very dense thickets, which is um, ideal tick habitat, and it can outcompete native understory plants as well. Oriental bittersweet is another woody plant, um, but this one is a vine. This is another one that is, um, it's not commonly used for landscape, but it's typically found in people's backyards just because it's so widespread. This is one of those tier four species. Um, it actually has been used for um, crafting. So in the winter, a lot of people use it to make wreaths because it is quite beautiful, the, the berries and the yellow capsule are very uh, appealing to the eye, but unfortunately they are very invasive and can cause a lot of damage. Um, to identify it in the, the spring and the summer, it has these um, egg-shaped to oval-shaped um, leaves that grow opposite on the stem. And they have orange roots and gray bark with these uh, very distinct lenticels you can see here. 
Um, in the late fall, or in the early fall, they develop the yellow capsule, and then the late fall, the capsule will burst to reveal this red berry. Um, again, it is very pretty, but these fruit do not provide enough nutrients, again, for the birds. Um, even though they do feed on it throughout the winter, it just doesn't have the amount of nutrients that they need that they can get from native plants. Um, so they'll continue to eat it and then spread the seeds, um, which will cause the oriental bittersweet to outcompete native species and can choke out trees and damage infrastructure. Um, so this is one that we definitely don't want because it can affect both the understory and um, the canopy of forests. Um, wineberry, so wineberry is another shrub and this one is related to rubus, so uh, like raspberry and blackberry um, native plants, but this one is an invasive. Um, it has very silver underside of leaves, which you can see here, and um, the leaves grow in sets of three. And the stem is very red and has these uh, red hairs that stick off of it that also grow um, around the fruit capsule. It also has thorns, which is similar to other rubus species, but this hairiness makes them more distinct. And it can grow in very dense thickets and decrease habitat quality for wildlife and outcompete the native rubus species, which are really important for birds. So birds love to eat raspberries and blackberries because um, they do provide a, the nutrients that they need. Um, and since this is related, it does have similar nutrients um, and the birds do feed on it, but it does have these invasive characteristics. So we wanna avoid having them eat this because um, it will decrease habitat quality over time. Um, it makes it difficult for other wildlife to pass through, which will have ripple effects on the entire ecosystem. So the American Robin has actually been found to feed on a lot of these invasive um, plants, specifically woody shrubs. Um, so they eat a lot of the fruits that are on those shrubs because they do overwinter here um, and contribute to their, their spread. Okay, and then there's also a bird that is invasive in itself. So you may have heard of this bird. It's called the European starling. Um, it's a black bird with iridescent and glossy plumage, um, and it has a yellow beak. Um, it's kind of dark here because they're in mating season here. Or this is a young bird, sorry. Um, but it does turn yellow as they get older, and they lose some of these spots as well. Um, but it is the most common bird in the United States right now. Um, there are millions of these birds, and they were brought over intentionally but have become very invasive and can cause millions of dollars in agricultural damage due to their foraging. Um, they carry diseases um, for other birds and other livestock animals, and their flocking is actually an air traffic hazard. They've, um, pilots have actually run into flocks of them and it causes damage to the engine. Um, it can cause a very big safety hazard for, for pilots and um, other like drones and things like that. So it's not a great species to have. Um, there are some chemicals that do target this species, um, but it's not recommended. I don't, chemicals are very, uh, touchy subject when, when dealing with controlling um, both wildlife and plant. Um, so I would just contact the, the DEC if you want more information on how to control starlings if you have them on your property. They have more information than I do on the, the starling side and um, the impacts to the environment. So there are multiple ways that you can get involved to stop the spread of invasive species um, and help birds stop the spread as well. Um, so planting native is a really, really big one. 
If you have native plants on your property, then the birds will come and they'll feed on those native plants. They'll have the nutrients that they need and they will not be spreading the invasive plants. So it's a win-win for everyone. Um, native plants support other wildlife as well. Um, so bees and um, like small mammals. So it's just really much better for the environment than invasive plants are. Um, it's also important to monitor your properties for new growth of invasive species. So if a bird has um, been on your property and released some of those seeds that they were feeding on other people's property, um, you can start invasive populations. So it's important to kind of monitor your, your area. And if you see something pop up, identify it and try to pull it um, while it's young so that we can again, reduce those costs of controlling. There are a few native alternatives for some of the shrubs that I've mentioned in this presentation. Um, so the American elderberry is a really great one. Um, button bush down here, the flowering raspberry and the nanny berry. So these are all um, recommended by the DEC as native landscaping shrubs. They support wildlife such as birds um, and bees, hummingbirds and other really important things for the environment. Um, they don't have those invasive characteristics so they won't take over your entire um, property. They're very visually appealing. I think the button bush is really cool and really fun to look at, um, but these are also great alternatives, um, especially for barberry, um, burning bush, honeysuckle, things like that that might be on your property. Another way that you can get involved is by using um, this tool called IMAP Invasives. It's an online GIS based mapping tool. Um, so this is a really great tool for um, both citizen scientists and natural resource professionals to use. Um, there's a mobile application that can be used offline so you can use it in the field. It will take the GPS coordinates that are on your phone. Um, you can snap a picture of the invasive species that you think might be on your property or on the trail that you're on, um, select that species, it will record the location, and then it will be uploaded to a big database that is checked through by natural resource professionals to make sure that it's an accurate um, identification. And then all of that data can be used to help natural resource professionals and um, home, homeowners and other landowners to um, create management plans for a specific species or for a specific area. So it's really, really cool and it's free and it's fairly easy to use. Um, it does take a little bit of getting used to, but the PRISM has a lot of information on how to use it. And we often do trainings throughout the year um, for setting up an account and um, operating the online and the uh, mobile application tools uh, the website, uh, imapinvasives.org, also has a ton of resources. Um, it's actually used in a lot of different states and even in Canada, but New York has their own um, sector of it that's run by the New York Natural Heritage Program. Um, they have a really great team of helpful people. So um, if you find their website, they have a list of different trainings and they have online resources for you to access um, so that you can get out in the field and help us map out invasive species. So um, that is all I have for you today. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to our office. Um, Nicole Campbell is gonna be your Go to gal. She is our terrestrial coordinator. So I have listed her email down here. Um, she is very knowledgeable and has a lot of information for you if you have any questions. Our website um, also has a lot of great resources. It has other webinars for you to get involved in and has our calendar um, where 
we put other events that we're hosting throughout the, the summer and the winter. And um, you can also pop into our office or call the office if you'd like to. We're based in Balsam Spa. Um, so if you have any questions or want more resources um, on how to get involved or how to manage something on your property, please feel free um, to contact us or, or visit the website. And I thank you for joining. Um, thank you for getting involved in Invasive Species Awareness Week. Um, sorry I couldn't be there in person for you. Um, hopefully um, things go back to normal soon. And um, yeah, we can have more events like this in person. So thank you again. Um, and I hope you've learned something today and uh, get out there and stop the spread of invasive species. Thank you. Thank you.